Please welcome Jason Forbes, Chief Digital and Media Officer, Cody Inc. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Good. How is everyone doing so far? Huh? Okay. So um, my name is Jason Forbes, as you just heard. I'm Chief Digital and Media Officer at Cochi. And um, what I wanted to share with you for the next few minutes was what we've been up to since uh, acquiring the, the beauty brands of Procter & Gamble about 18 months ago in digital. And a key emphasis that you'll hear around today is harnessing consumer data. So we'll talk a little bit more around that. So I wanted to begin, though, with, with, B, um, with Cody's mission. And so if you think about our mission, it's to celebrate and liberate the diversity of your beauty. And what's exciting for us in digital is using or taking that, that purpose, really, and understanding in digital what that means in terms of infinite choice. Obviously, with digital, being able to personalize nearly everything allows us to reimagine what diversity really means for every single consumer in the marketplace. And another critical part is from a mission perspective. And so as we think about our, our mission at Koji, it's as a challenger to become the global leader in beauty. Now that sounds like a very bold statement, so I wanted to unpack it for a second. When we say the challenger, what we really mean is as a large company challenging every major status quo. And that begins by historical understandings of beauty. So we are looking for every single consumer, man or woman, to reimagine what beauty means, moving away from stereotypes and norms into beauty being really from what each individual person wants that to be, a celebration of that individual diversity. So one of the ways we're, we're doing this, and really success for us, is, is better understanding consumer needs. And if we're honest about it, particularly for non-digital companies in, in beauty, which are is consumer packaged goods, historically they've not had a direct relationship with the consumer. So many beauty companies, like larger companies, are actually not wired the right way. They don't typically know how to engage with consumers on an ongoing basis. So really success for us has looked like better understanding unmet consumer needs, and looking at and evolving both our products and the ambassadors around our products to bring those unmet needs to life. So to give you a real life example, as we look at a brand like Rimmel and a new brand ambassador like Cara Delevingne, understanding an unmet need for many consumers around edgier looks and allowing those consumers to get those edgier looks via Rimmel and Cara has been one example of a shifting brand emphasis and shifting or evolving our ambassadors to better meet those unmet needs. So across our portfolio, we're, we're, we're fortunate in that we have a, an enviable number of, of brands, and increasing those brands are being connected through consumer data. Better understanding for an individual consumer which brands both within our portfolio and outside our portfolio are directly relevant to her. So I want to talk a little bit about the new normal. And um, this, this slide from Facebook really talks about an unprecedented level of, of behavioral change across consumers. The, the, the woman on the left is my mom, uh, the kid on the right is my, my son, and with my mom, she had three TV stations to choose from back in the day. My son has an infinite number of augmented reality worlds to choose from. So the, the implication is this choice is creating massive levels of consumer change. And if we think about a number of different companies in the marketplace, what we're experiencing right now is that a large number of those companies are experiencing a level of brand volatility, company volatility that didn't exist before. So to be super specific, in 10 years time, 40% of companies on the S&P 500 will no longer exist. That's kind of based on historical data that we've seen so far. The pace of change has never been greater. The level of brand volatility has never been greater. And so one of the things that, that, that terrifies us and fascinates us is this idea of brand irrelevance. Your brand will no longer be relevant if you cannot key into your consumers, if you cannot understand what they're looking for, the platforms where they spend their time, the messaging that resonates with them. And a one size fits all will continue to fail. It's increasingly failing. And that's kind of why we, we use that implication of choice to inform everything we're doing through better understanding that consumer data. So the exciting thing about it is actually, as, as we look at companies in the beauty space, and this level of, of change in consumer behavior. What we're seeing is many companies are simply unable to cope with the level of change being, being confronted with right now. On the flip side, however, companies that are doing it best, companies that are taking consumer data and turning it into behavioral insights, 
are outperforming their peers by 85% in sales and 25% in margin. So success looks like taking the data and using it to your advantage. And if we think back to beauty and think back to Koji's purpose in beauty, which is all understanding the diversity, celebrating the diversity of her beauty, that's exactly where we aim to be. Make sense so far? Yeah. yeah? So this is actually a slide from, from YouTube, which I love, because kind of top left, you know, by harnessing consumer data, what we're looking to do is become less reliant as a portfolio of brands on old school channels like a 23-year-old in your local boots trying to cope with the diversity of hundreds of thousands of different types of consumers coming through the door, giving them beauty advice. So we're complementing those traditional physical in-store channels with digital channels. And the power of those digital channels is we're able to offer a much richer choice in terms of content and in terms of products across online and digital, allowing for far greater interactivity and meeting that diversity than was previously possible. So we see that omni-channel play as being a critical part of Coty's digital strategy. So I've talked a little bit about the kind of the what in terms of our, our, our purpose and our mission. I've also touched a little bit about kind of the why. We, we, we think that this is a critical way that, that not just Coty, but other brands in the marketplace are looking to. But I also want to spend a bit of time around the how. And so about two years ago, Koji acquired a MarTech company called Beamly. Uh, I was the CEO of Beamly at the time. And one of the reasons why Cody acquired Beamly was this four-pillar approach. So just to deconstruct it very quickly, it begins with consumers, which is top left. If you understand your consumers better than anybody else and apply that insight, you will outperform your peers. So it, it's founded, it's forged in better understanding consumers, their needs, their behaviors, what messages will resonate with them, et cetera. And we take that consumer data or insight and we use that to inform the content we create, the ways that we message to them, the types of audiences that we go after. So if we think about our brand portfolio covering, say, CoverGirl to Rimmel to Sally Hansen to Max Factor to Bourgeois, each of those brands sits within the marketplace and, and has different levels of resonance. We can actually test different images, different videos with different consumers to make sure that it actually resonates with the consumers or audiences in that market. So that's what the Content Foundry is all about, taking that consumer data or insight and using it to actually inform the types of creative, the types of content, video, imagery that we develop. And we take that and we use that to inform the types of media that we activate. So with Beamly, it's active across all major channels of social, so Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and programmatic as well. As we take that data, take that customized content, if you will, and activate it on the platforms where she spends her time. And when we do this well, what you therefore have are qualified audiences, because you've got the right consumer with the right content on the right platform coming to our sites. When I say our sites, I mean both our own brand sites, but also retailer sites as well. So for example, with Feel Unique in the front here with Joelle and others as well, we're working very closely to understand how we as Koji can actually bring the right types of consumers to retailer sites to drive higher levels of e-commerce growth. So it's a powerful model, and the most important part about it is across this loop, we're collecting the data to get smarter and smarter each time round. So we're not there yet, but you can kind of see how the model comes to life. So what we've done at Koji is we've taken that four pillar model and turned it into effectively the same four pillar model, just with different words. So sensing is all around better understanding the consumer. Storytelling is all around creative. Surrounding is all around the media I just described. And selling is all around omni-channel. And you can kind of see some specific examples that we've made Coty's own. For example, Trends Lab, which I'll talk about in just a second. So around unmet consumer needs, which I, which I referenced at the beginning of the discussion, this really is where, where rubber meets the road. If, if done well, if you understand your consumer's needs better than anybody else, you will outperform. And what often happens is companies rely on traditional research. I ran a secondary report using secondary data, and here's what the marketplace is saying. Typically, brands are not spending day in, day out with consumers, using the consumer data and applying it to their decisions. It's much harder than it sounds. It isn't a research report from a third party. Those have a place. It's taking your data, taking their data, and combining it to inform the decisions that you make. I'll give you some real-life examples of this. 
So you see up here kind of six major unmet needs. We've, we've captured hundreds, but these are, are, are ones that will be relevant for today's discussion. So one of the biggest unmet needs is consumers saying, I want trend-driven looks relevant for me. And this is the big miss, is often brands will create trend-driven looks which aren't relevant for a specific consumer. So by understanding which trends will be relevant for which specific consumers, we can create content relevant for that consumer. That doesn't imply 100,000 different videos. It implies segmenting the market so you're more likely to resonate with that one image or that one video by testing that in advance to make sure that those trends will be relevant for that consumer, for that brand, or even for that retailer. So the fun part about this is, I'll take another example here around, um, I want to try on looks without going to the store. So there's been a lot of discussion around augmented reality. And one of the biggest fails to date around augmented reality is the friction it's created. We, we personally at Coty have had a number of augmented reality apps which have not succeeded. Most apps from brands around augmented reality have failed. The reason why is you're expecting a consumer to download an app for one brand. That's almost never going to happen. A Sephora app could be hugely successful, is hugely successful, but brand-specific apps will almost typically fail because you're asking the consumer to do too much. So the real innovation that we've been pushing for at Koji with our partners like Motiface, Holition, et cetera, is create a mobile web AR experience. So you don't need to download an app. You literally go to a website, and the AR is there. That's a huge unmet need and creates huge actually argues to do away with the friction of having to go to the app store to download the app. We have a phrase at Cody called the app graveyard. How many people have on their phone dozens of apps they never use? Let's do away with the app graveyard by responding directly to unmet consumer needs. A third one is around kind of beauty advice. Consumers want beauty advice, again, personalized for them. So if we take our purpose at Cody seriously, it's all around personalized beauty advice. So you can read the other ones there, but the important part is we are becoming much more disciplined at Koji, taking one specific need and understanding what that would look like in terms of new capability. So each of those needs we've used to inform a specific capability that we're now kind of building out. So for example, that desire for trending looks relevant for individual consumers, we built a capability called Trends Lab, which I'll sh share with you in just a second. This example around kind of, you know, I want to try on looks virtually, but without downloading an app, has informed the kind of the AR capabilities I'm going to share with you in a few minutes as well. We're also working much more heavily in artificial intelligence, using that to personalize the recommendations with partners like Amazon, but also internally as well. So in each case you see here, what we're looking to do is capitalize on the unmet consumer need and create a capability based on that need. And that doesn't need to be all Coty. We think very strongly about build, buy, or ally. Build, do it yourself internally. Ally, find partners, great partners to work with. And buy is, is actual acquisition. We've made a number of, of great acquisitions in, in the last kind of few years um, that have really kind of helped accelerate our digital capability overall. So with those kind of needs, where we kind of, I just want to go back one more, is, can I go back one? I should have said, is what's critical is it's not just about the need and building a capability or experience around that. It's also around the KPIs. And we saw from Tammy earlier, there's, she had like what? Like 40, 50 different metrics. So for us, there's, and for everybody, there's a big difference between metrics and key performance indicators. And the three you see there, we hold on to religiously in terms of e-commerce success. First of all, percentage sales conversion. You've created this great, frictionless, augmented reality experience. Is anybody buying anything? It's not the only metric, but as you think about conversion, how many people are actually ending up buying something becomes massively important. The second one is basket size. And for those who know Amazon well, they're actually here today, they will tell you directly that cosmetic profitability on the Amazon store is a major problem. If consumers are only buying a $5 lipstick, it's not profitable for anybody. So finding ways to shift the debate from individual SKUs of lipstick to looks is not just attractive to Amazon and to other major online retailers, it's attractive to all of us as well. If we can shift the basket size from five bucks to a 25 buck, buck look, then everybody has a more profitable model to build on. And that's what we spend a lot of time with Joel and his team around. And the last one is frequency. So they bought, but did they come back again? So those types of KPIs really help us understand, are we meeting an unmet consumer need? Are we activating the right capability around that need? And is it actually working? And so that kind of model is how we use it as a compass, if you will, to inform our, our definition of success. 
So I wanted to share very quickly kind of like five kind of launches today, if you will. Um, the first one I mentioned is around kind of Trends Lab. And we've been using this over the past 12 months really to programmatically scan across imagery, across video on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, et cetera, to understand not just the trends, but what's the trend velocity. Meaning, is it, for example, like halo eye or holographic lip, which has peaked and it's now going into decline? So trend velocity speaks to the growth rate of a trend. And if you can key in on that trend velocity for a specific consumer segment in a specific consumer market and find a brand that's relevant for that trend, you're onto gold. And so we haven't cracked this yet, but as we've begun to share with brands, these are the trends relevant for you. Stay away from these. For example, the whole Me Too movement is much more relevant to, to Gen Z and millennials. Older demographics, there's actually a disconnect. So by understanding which trends are, are resonating and making sure you speak authentically to the right audience with the right message using that trend analysis, you can be more effective. So that's one kind of like important capability we've begun activating. The other important one, is really translating those trends into looks. And so we're now actually able, in some cases, to take a trend that we've identified and turn that into a brand-specific look in seven days or less. That's really important, right? Because if you're spending three months, six months to activate a look with a brand, you might be too late. So this ability to turn things around rapidly in a much more agile fashion is a critical capability we've begun to not just launch, but work with our retailer partners to bring to life as well. So the third one is actually with, um, with Amazon. Um, and as I mentioned, that they're in the room today. We've been doing some really exciting work with them. This is actually kind of a, a skill called Let's Get Ready, which actually uses Amazon Echo. So it actually is reliant not just on voice, but on visual assistance as well. So there's actually 2,000 different combinations of, of looks that can be created via this skill on, on Amazon. And it speaks to the use of artificial intelligence, either via Alexa or through other third parties, to better drive personalization. And why we love personalization is it speaks to our purpose of greater diversity. So two last ones. This is actually with, um, with uh, Boots in the UK. And we just launched this before Christmas. This is a, a fragrance finder recommendation engine. And what's powerful about this is it uses artificial intelligence. So we had a previous fragrance finder on Boots that used just kind of like a typical decision tree. This fragrance finder, we set it live before Christmas. It's now training itself. So every time it makes a recommendation, based on what the consumer does, it gets smarter to say next time around, for that type of consumer with these types of needs, don't offer this fragrance, offer this other one instead. So it kind of uses what's called machine learning to get smarter and smarter. And what we're seeing is the click-through rate of recommendations this AI-powered fragrance finder is making are three to five times higher than any other recommendation engine we've, we've, we've been exposed to before. So a really kind of powerful implication for driving e-commerce success if the recommendations you're making around fragrances are relevant for that consumer, they're much more likely to buy. And the AI that sits underneath there doesn't need to be constrained just to fragrances. It could work across eye, lip, face, entire looks. So that's where we're looking to go next. So the last kind of like one I wanted to share today was, a was around augmented reality. As I mentioned before, AR is not new, but actually kind of AR without the need to download an app is new. And the reason why that's complicated is with an app, there's a large amount of memory size in that app. With mobile web, you need to be as light as possible or the page will take 50 seconds to load. No one's going to wait 50 seconds for the page to load. So the technical challenge, not that anybody cares, is finding a mobile web experience that loads quickly that actually offers credible rendering of different looks. This isn't just eyebrows or lip. These are entire looks. So this is my wife, which I'm not going to spend time on today. But it was either me and I looked like a clown or my wife who doesn't, she looks quite good actually, so we went with that for today. But I wanted to show you an actual video across a diverse set of, of people just to bring this to life because diversity is important. If this only works on a certain like, type of person with a certain skin tone, we're a fail. So again, what we're trying to do with this experience is evolve it over time. So ultimately, every type of ethnicity will actually, the, the rendering and the looks will be super kind of powerful. So I wanted to show you a kind of a 30 second demo to bring it to life. And before I do, the one really important thing is look for the fact that all you got to do is click on your camera, and anyone in the room can actually play with this right now. If you go to covergirl.com forward slash try it, the lighting here isn't great. It needs a bit of lighting, so maybe at the break, check it out. But the other critical part is we are pleased to announce today that this Covergirl launch is with the largest retailer in the world. So Walmart and Covergirl 
are exclusively partnering. So when consumers find the look they like, they click once and are taken directly to Walmart's checkout page, where all the SKUs for that look are built into the shopping cart. And again, that sounds kind of like kind of geeky and irrelevant. It isn't, because we believe religiously in looking at friction points. And if a consumer finds the look and has to enter in all the individual SKUs or find the SKUs, you're dead. Or they go to a product page, you've got to piece it all together. Being taken directly to the checkout page with all of the SKUs for the look baked in is what we call a frictionless experience. So we haven't cracked the code, but we're, we're excited about this uh, demo, so we'd love to, to show you briefly. So if we could show the video, that would be amazing. And she hits checkout, and the look is hers. So what do you guys think? We good? OK. <laughs> so, so we were going to try the live demo today, but there's some kind of uh, some, some challenges with this room. We're going to try a kind of quasi uh, live demo just to kind of to bring it to life. So Elodie um, was going to kind of join me on stage. Round of applause, Elodie. <laughs> and we're going to just kind of show you kind of like how this works. So it really is, it's frictionless, and that's the most important part about it. So if we kind of get a, some imagery going of LED, hopefully you guys will get to see. Fingers crossed. There we go. So there's LED. It's real. And you see the five looks there. So LED can actually scroll look to look and actually kind of select a look and actually see how that look looks like on her. And the rendering, meaning kind of like if you move quickly, does the AR actually kind of keep up, is actually pretty accurate. And so we're super delighted, in this case, with Holition. Uh, as I mentioned, we work with Modiface, Holition, and others. This is Holition from the UK, who's created this kind of frictionless AR experience. And the fun part about it is it's configurable. We can change these five looks, and in two weeks' time, have another five looks. So back to our purpose of diversity, Every single person can actually see how our products look like on them. They actually become an individual influencer, an individual brand in and of themselves, which we think is kind of pretty special. So, um, and there you go. So, and Ellie, you can kind of like go through, you can kind of see all the looks baked in there, or the SKUs baked in there, and then one click, check out, and away we go. So we're launching this today. We will know in probably about a month's time whether this has been successful, but in terms of meeting an unmet consumer need, building a great experience, and connecting with a partner like Walmart, we're super excited. So, uh, <laughs> LED, thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, last slide. So, uh, ultimately, uh, like I want to be abundantly clear. We have not cracked the code. We are, as coach, we've got a long way to go, as you've seen from uh, some of the kind of challenges we've had in the last 18 months, but we think we're moving in the right direction. We think that the, the strategy I'm describing is a very powerful one, which really is around kind of challenging the status quo. And if we think back to kind of like the current model of selling an individual at, at scale to everybody in a given marketplace, you know, uh, what we believe and I believe passionately about is around those four pillars and how any beauty brand can benefit from using those four pillars to drive awesome consumer experiences by keying in and unmet needs. And I think kind of for the industry as a whole, our hope is to move away from what we call old school to bold school, which is ultimately using those four pillars to drive amazing digital success. Thank you very much. So any questions before I jump? What kind of changes have you had to make internally to achieve that kind of velocity? So um, a, a lot of it has been around actually sitting down with, with major stakeholders, like not just kind of internally but externally. So many of our, our so we have three divisions. We have consumer beauty. We have luxury, which includes a lot of fragrance brands, like for example Gucci, uh, Hugo Boss, 
Burberry, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have a professional division. Particularly with that, that luxury division, our stakeholders are not just internal stakeholders, it's the fashion houses themselves. And the fashion houses, as much as internal stakeholders, are super hungry for valuable consumer insights. And so decision making and actually velocity has been accelerated by showing them, if we do this well, what that consumer data may mean. So why would you activate all this media around this video when we can show you to statistical significance, this video is not resonating with the audience that you're going after. Like, you'd be shocked, maybe you wouldn't be, how much wasted media still occurs, how much wasted creative development occurs. This brand in this marketplace should never have activated this video. And up until now, there's been a kind of a, a reluctance to use that data to actually say, stop. Save your dollars, okay? Reimagine the video, better understand what she's looking for, and create imagery, video, actually work with a different set of influencers more relevant to her. So what we're, what we're seeing, therefore, is if you actually provide those examples and actually show how it works and show the impact and the KPIs, that's where the velocity is beginning to occur. Yeah? Uh, you've talked a lot about understanding the audiences. Do you feel your brands have a clear understanding of their target or a clear vision of where they want to go, who they want to go after? A, a much clearer, clearer version uh, or kind of like interpretation. So, so yeah, like I, I think for, for everybody, kind of as I mentioned before, you know, beauty is CPG. T historically, CPG companies, beauty companies have not had a direct relationship with consumers. They've worked into retailers and retailers have provided some level of aggregated data. We've never had an opportunity as an industry really which has now existed over the last 10 years. So what we've seen in the last like 18, 24 months has been a dramatic turnaround in terms of those brands really keying in to understand what is their brand purpose? Like who are they intending to reach with their, their message and confirming that that message is relevant for that audience. So we've seen some really exciting changes and the, the CoverGirl relaunch, which is happening literally right now, and the Max Factor relaunch are both great examples of brands reimagining themselves to regain even greater relevance for the consumer or the audiences that they're going after. So it's pretty exciting, but as I mentioned, a lot of work still to be done. Thank you. industry really come from the smaller brands that might have a more true connection and passion for the actual product itself. How do they, do they get beaten out of the market completely because they don't have the financial backing or the scale to accomplish something like this? Like how can they participate in this type of technology? No, I actually think it, it, it's the opposite because I, I think the way that smaller brands are architected is they often begin with much greater proximity to the consumer. Uh, often they are small brands typically because they haven't been around that long. If they haven't been around that long, they've often begun with an unmet consumer need. So you know, I'll name like 50 kind of startups to you, and many times what they've done is they've looked at the marketplace and go, this is ridiculous. Why is there no one doing the following? And that no one doing the following is typically keying in in an unmet need, like personalized fragrances, personalized makeup, actually creating content relevant for a specific consumer. And they start small, and they build up over time. They build more financial clout because they're keying in on an unmet need. So for me, this is much less around technology. This is much more around a philosophy, is if you start with your consumer, whether it's through focus groups, through people speak, speaking to people on the street, you will actually find that uh, that dialogue, that direct dialogue, is massively valuable in informing everything that you do, from content to media to product development. So you're saying they need to be doing what you guys are doing and learning to do? <laughs> that's one interpretation. But no, no, no. Well, no, I, I don't think it's, I think ultimately, as they do that better, they gain share. As they gain share, they ultimately are, are able to do more things. Like if you look at companies like um, NYX, for example, or Urban Decay, kind of like a lot of the acquisition behavior behind them was they tapped into an unmet consumer need and that made them highly attractive. So I think if you're a startup in the room, it's a great time to be alive. Because in many cases, you know, a, an acquirer isn't bringing in the technology like in Nix's case, they're bringing in a philosophy. It's a way of looking at the marketplace. You know, kind of L'Oreal have mentioned the reason why they acquired Nix was not to L'Orealize Nix, but to Nixify L'Oreal, right? So it's a good example of how we can all relearn, but in all cases, it's not the technology. It's starting with the consumer, where we think a kind of a much bigger difference c can happen. Yeah. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, it, with the uh, Walmart example with the looks, and it goes into your shopping cart, you can buy it then, or and or go to the store? Yes. Uh, do you think it'll 
drive fewer people to the store, or there's just always going to be consumers who want to still go get it? I, I think at the end of the day, it, it's, it's about consumer choice. There will definitely be consumers who want to pick it up in the store. This initial um, journey is all around kind of buying it online, um, and we want to see how that performs. But at, with time, you've obviously heard of kind of like your research online, buy, buy in store. So there's a lot of omni-channel behaviors that become very powerful. And for retailers with loyalty card data, connecting these online journeys with in-store behavior kind of offers an even more exciting way to better understand what touch points are having the greatest amount of, of, of impact. So you know, the whole goal is to use that feedback loop to learn at scale over time. Yeah. That's all the time we have for questions. Guys, thank you so much. Appreciate it.